Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeremy Mark. I'm a senior fellow with the Geoeconomic Center at the Atlantic Council, and I'd like to welcome you to our next session where we are going to dig into development and finance, uh, uh, China's lending, its aid, its investment in what is being called the Global South, but I'm going to uh, use the moderator's privilege and refer to low-income and middle-income countries. That seems to be a more neutral term than what we were using before. Uh, real quickly, just to introduce uh, the topic, uh, we've heard a great deal today about uh, uh, a lot of the big picture aspects of, of China's interaction with the developing world. And I think what we're going to try to do here is to sort of dig into, into the lifeblood of this interaction, which is money. Uh, the, the lending, uh, investment, and aid that China has offered to both low-income and middle-income countries over the past decade amounts to a vast sum, well over a, a trillion dollars. And, based on aid data's statistics, the commitments are even larger than that. So, you know, there's a lot of issues that now revolve around the flow of capital out of China to these countries. Uh, and many of you are aware that the lending in particular has contributed to a, a, a debt problem in many countries now that has to be addressed. And it even presents a potentially serious risk to Chinese lenders at a moment of economic downturn in China. So um, uh, what we'll get into this now, and what I want to do is real quickly introduce our speakers, uh, and then we'll turn to questions. Uh, we have two speakers today who are joining us remotely. First from New Delhi is Veda uh, Vaidanathan, an associate fellow in foreign policy and security at the Center for Social and Economic Progress. She is also affiliated with Harvard University's Asia Center and the Institute of Chinese Studies in New Delhi. Joining us from uh, Copenhagen is an Atlantic Council colleague, Wawa Wang, who uh, is with the Global China Hub. She's also a, a senior fellow, and she is director of Just Finance International, a non-government organization focused on issues related to development finance. We are having some technical issues today, and so Wawa will be with us in voice and not in by picture, and I'm sure that won't interfere with her participation in the slightest. Now, sitting at, here at the table at the center is Samantha Custer, who is Director of Policy Analysis at Aid Data, which is a research lab at William & Mary College's Global Research Institute. Sam's team at Aid Data examines foreign policy and development issues and is well known, very well known, for its work on Chinese lending. Now, last and certainly not least, to my left at the table is uh, Jude Moore, a senior policy fellow at the Center for Global Development here in Washington. He's a lecturer at the University of Chicago's Harris School for Public Policy and a former senior official in Liberia under, under President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Welcome to all of you. Uh, why don't we get right into the questions? I'm going to focus in on, on the debt issue for the moment. Uh, and I'd like to start with Veda, please. Um, can you talk to us a bit about uh, China's approach to development aid in uh, low, lower and middle income countries, how it might differ from, differ from the practices of traditional Western donors, multilateral institutions, and what do you see as some of the key principles guiding China's policy? First off, very quickly, it's wonderful to be here, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm actually going to um, use the term Global South only because it's easier to say at this point. <laughs> um, I think there are a bunch of um, factors that set Chinese lending to the Global South, especially countries in Africa, a region that I study closely. Um, one of them would be the number and the sheer types of lenders there are. I think it was the um, China Africa Research Institute that came out with a study a few years ago that said in early 2000s, there were three Chinese lenders, and now there are, I think, 39 or so. So I think the sheer number of Chinese, um, the kinds of lenders, the kind of terms that they lend on, um, all of that is incredibly diverse. There's also a lot of innovative instruments that we see um, that the Chinese have included. 
for instance, just to give you one example would be the um, agricultural technology demonstration centers. It's, um, you know, it's, it encompasses a lot of things, but the idea of tech transfer of technology, uh, not just transfer technology, but also transfer of skills. In theory, it is a model where Chinese scientists work very closely with um, scientists from different countries um, where they are hosted. Uh, one of the one of the ones that I studied, and we can talk about this later, is the one in Zambia, where um, Jilin University was working very closely with uh, professors from UNSA. So the model itself was very novel. The construction, again, the money for the construction of the building came from China, but um, you know some of the labs and some of the equipment were locally sourced. Um, a lot of the smallholder community farmers came to the center, but the impact of the center itself and what it did—that's um, a different story. Um, similarly, this emphasis on capacity building. I think a few uh, members in previous panels talked about high-level educational visits, sending bureaucrats from countries in Africa and other parts of the global south to China. That's definitely there. But in some spaces, just to give you another perspective, um, I was in the Copper Belt province in Zambia, and there was this um, tiny vocational center in Ndola, and there were uh, you know, a lot of flyers and a lot of conversations about how they could send technicians from these tiny universities to places in China. So the idea of really going, um, you know, bringing like a nuanced perspective to this idea of capacity building also sets it apart. Then, of course, the idea that Chinese lending is not uniform, you know, so I think five or six countries in Africa account for over 50 percent of China's lending. But these are some of the things that send that sort of set Chinese um, lending apart. And I think this is one of the reasons why China is seen as an alternative to a lot of the countries in the global south. And one of the reasons that China is winning or has been maybe not winning, that makes it sound very um, gamey, but uh, one of the reasons China's been doing really well is also because of these reasons, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sam, let's turn to you and let's sort of take a, a, a bigger picture view of the debt issue, if we could, please. Can you talk a bit about your, your understanding of how China manages its lending practices, debt relations with countries, and what are some of the implications of China's debt diplomacy for the recipient country's economic stability and sovereignty? Yeah, thanks for the question. And I, I think I'll, I'll start by building off of Beta's great answer. So, you know, when I think about what are the differences and uniqueness of how, what China offers to the world, I, I go to my five point uh, cheat sheet, which is my, my rule of thumb. So, one is the scale of what we're talking about here. Over two decades, we're talking about $1.3 trillion um, in financing. That far outstrips most other, um, other donors on the market speed. When we're talking about delivery of things like big ticket infrastructure projects, a typical uh, Chinese financed infrastructure project two and a half times as fast as a competitor from a multilateral development bank. Um, you know, focus. Uh, I think Veda alluded to this a little bit. You know, traditionally, when you think about the chronic infrastructure deficits that the global south is facing, when you're looking to where to finance that, China used to be uh, one of the only funders uh, in town. Terms are important, and that kind of starts to, to transition us into this debt-related question. So China, uh, I have a colleague who likes to call China a banker and not a benefactor, and that's because when you look at how China is financing most of these infrastructure projects, it's using debt instruments and it's debt instruments such as loans that are approaching market rates. And that's a little bit different than what we see traditionally. And then finally, transparency. And this is also challenging when it comes to these debt conversations. Unlike an actor like a US or UK that has to report uh, its, its terms and its projects to the OECD, you don't see the same thing with China. So how is China managing all of this portfolio? Um, you know, it's been interesting to watch. I think China has been strategic and opportunistic, but it didn't have a master plan from the start of this. If you think back to 2013, it positioned itself as a go-to infrastructure lender. Um, and it was credible because it was seen as being willing to bankroll um, infrastructure projects at scale. I think what we see 10 years in, though, 
is that we're dealing with some of the unintended repercussions of these choices. Um, we now see that uh, 50 percent of the, or 55 percent of these loans that China has been uh, providing to the Global South are actually now um, entering into repayment. By 2030, that's going to be more like 75 percent. The Global South has accumulated a rather large debt burden. We're talking about $2.6 trillion, including principal and interest. That's a lot of money to repay. Um, and we're seeing some, some growing pains with this. And China is trying to adapt on the fly. And you see them starting to, act, to deal with the fact that they have now become not only the largest infrastructure banker, but they're the largest debt collector in the world. And so you're seeing interesting things like um, the, in, the inclusion of cash collateral. 75% of projects now include things like escrow, escrow accounts. You know, if you're engaging in risky markets, you need to park money somewhere so that you can access this if um, borrowers are starting to slow to repay. Um, you see penalties are being sharper if people are, are late on repayment. Um, you're looking at emergency lending starting to pick in. How do you increase the liquidity of borrowers that are struggling to repay? Um, and then you're also seeing some professionalization. You know, Veda said 39 um, different actors. We're actually counting now over 700 actors. And what's been fascinating is the shift from um, the shift to commercial entities. So these are commercial state-owned banks in China, but also Western commercial banks, like Standard Chartered. And they're co-financing they're co these same loans. So some different things to try to navigate these risks. Okay. Increasingly, restructuring is now becoming a part of the mm -hmm. debt picture. Uh, do you see uh, uh, China's efforts to restructure as beginning to damage its, its relations with recipient countries? We've heard various reports about debt trap, et cetera, whether or not that's an accurate description of China's policy. It's part of the narrative. How do you see this playing out? Yeah, I hate the term debt trap diplomacy because I think it has the unfortunate uh, coincidence of being wrong. Um, <laughs> but you know, aside from that, I think you know, say it assumes that countries lack agency. Uh, it takes two people to sign up to these agreements. Um, but I think you're right. Like there is this challenge of what happens when countries start feeling the burden of having to repay. What happens? Um, and similar to what I said before. Uh, you know, China is fundamentally a banker with this. They, what you don't see often is outright, I'm writing off these loans. I'm, I'm forgiving them. You see it sporadically. Every once in a while, they're like really old loans that are basically bad loans at this point, or they were the ones that were earlier on that were like 0% or very low concessionality. So it's kind of like not too much of a burden for China to just write that off. That's not what is, is happening in most cases. What you see is kind of a willingness to restructure and defer. So to push out when these loans are due, to restructure the financing terms of these things, that's far more common. Um, what you see on the, the demand side uh, in Global South countries, there's a variety of reactions. So on the one hand, there's caution. Um, you are seeing an uptick in projects that are being suspended or canceled. Uh, so there are about 94 of them now. And I think that when you look at the details of most of these things, it's often domestic governments that are starting to pull back, right? So that's an early warning signal of maybe not, you know, this, the, the, the heyday of this is not quite as, as high as it used to be. Um, I think also you see approval ratings uh, for China, kind of a course measure going down. Um, globally because of some of the high profile difficulty that, that these countries are having. But here's the challenge. It's not all bad news or all um, pushback from countries. Countries are still signing new agreements. I saw one from Sri Lanka the, <laughs> the other day. Um, this is a country that had a major embarrassing messy default, not only because of China, but partly because of China, and is still signing on to new agreements with China. Um, China is still the number one preferred infrastructure partner in the Global South. We asked leaders in 120 countries. 40% of them said China is our preferred partner. In Africa, it's even higher. So I think it's, you know, there's a wariness that uh, you have to be careful in engaging in this debt finance development, but I think China is still a partner. Judy, let's take this a little further. Sure. Um, sort of the perspective of recipient countries mm -hmm. at this point. Um, how do they perceive, recipient countries, how do they perceive China's development assistance, lending finance, what factors you think are shaping their decision to engage with China on development initiatives? And 
do they see you know, clear benefits to, to engaging with China like this? Yeah, again, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and, and, and thank you. I, I think Kenya's experience over the last uh, was seven or 10 days is pretty instructive. Um, for the last three years, most emerging economies, but most of the ones in Africa, were effectively shut off the international financial markets. They couldn't go to the markets to issue debt. And the terms at which Kenya actually did uh, over the last, uh, say, seven to 10 days was 10.5%. So the sovereign had to borrow. The coupon rate is 10.5%. That's, that's how steep it is. And there's a study that shows that countries that issue debt at 10.5%, uh, more than 60% of them eventually default on that. That's how bad it is. And so for many African countries, the, the debt they actually got from China wasn't concessional. It was close to market rates. But it wasn't as if African countries just had this myriad opportunities and for some strange reasons decided to choose the Chinese option. Right? It, it, the, the, the number of options available to them weren't that much. And one of the things that I like to, to stress about this relationship is that a part of what we are seeing is a reflection of African interest and demands. I'm just speaking from the African side. That, you know, in, from 1975, 1975, say 2002, investment on the continent had been declining at almost 8.9% a year. In, in, across the OECD, it was increasing by 20 to 25%. In East Asia, it was almost 30%. So if this is the context, when the Chinese show up, they were literally the only game in town. And for certain projects at above a certain margin, um, they, they, especially for mega projects, 500 million or more, only the Chinese were financing that. So I think there is an understanding of the debt implications of this, but what options are there, right? I mean, this is a continent where the population has been growing faster than economic growth, which means that, and, and the terms of trade, I mean, since the 1990s, more than, uh, there was a report last year, actually, I should use that, from UNCTAD, that said 45 of Africa's uh, 54 economies depend on commodity exports for more than 60% of their revenue, which means Africa isn't adding value to what it's exporting. And the terms of trade are negative. It means that Africa is earning less and less from trade. How does it pay for its infrastructure? How does it pay to provide social services? And if China is the only uh, lender credible enough who at least has an appetite for perceived African risks, then this is the partner that they're going to deal with. So it's not an, an absence of, of understanding the implications of debt, of understanding the implication of the deals they're entering. It's just if you're going to govern, you have to do something. And the final thing I would say here is I have this thing where I say that the more democratic an African country becomes, the closer it becomes to China. Not because the, the but democracy means that in, in campaigning, we promise we're going to deliver and what is the greatest need across the continent, infrastructure. So once the democratic government sets in, you turn to the partner most likely to provide infrastructure and they mm -hmm. become closer and closer to China. And of course, we're at the point now where, where we're seeing Chinese lending, not just in Africa, but across uh, the developing world, drop sharply. That's correct. Uh, because of the debt problems that have emerged and because of the problems the Chinese economy is facing. And it's a point I want to come back to in a moment. But first, I'd like to, to turn to Wawa, please bring her into the discussion. Um, it, I think it's useful at this point to sort of you know, look beyond the straight, the, just the economic and, and widen our lens a bit to address the issue of the impact of Chinese lending, Chinese finance on issues related to governance, issues related to the rule of law, um, and I, particularly when it comes to how these in, uh, interplay with infrastructure lending, for example. And I know you do work on this, Wawa, and could, so could you talk about the extent of, to which China's finance, its, its form of conditionality on loans, the increased diplomatic involvement in recipient countries that, that occurs as a result of all of this financial support, how this alters uh, policies of recipient government and how it can affect recipient government's interaction with their own citizens, please. Thanks, Jeremy, for having me here. Um, I would like to take the moment to actually 
welfare practitioner's point of view from observing the so-called Chinese investments and impacts in recipient countries. Um, as an organization, we work extensively with citizens and civic actors in recipient countries. And unfortunately, um, I have to really play the devil's advocate here and challenge the notion that Chinese investments and projects actually fulfill development needs from our observation and monitoring. Um, what we have seen really is that the vastness and readiness of China's financing with very little um, social economic or environmental conditionalities attached to it, unlike um, multilateral development lending, have actually led to ruling elites changing and altering legislation that govern environmental, social, and human rights protection in order to facilitate greater capital flows from China, even as Chinese investors have repeatedly flaunted demands for greater transparency. Mm. Obviously, the impacts are multifolded in terms um, of um, you know, um, the scale. Um, I think, as Samantha put very well, um, China's been bankrolling um, infrastructure projects at scale. The majority of those projects to date are large-scale infrastructure projects that ultimately, first and foremost, benefit the export demands and needs of Chinese companies, many of which have been blacklisted and debarred by multilateral development organizations for a variety of reasons. So the question really is, um, you know, against this backdrop of context um, and particularly um, the type of risks associated with that kind of projects, um, recipient countries have actually wreaked devastating impacts on their own climate, environment, and human rights. So I think, um, you know, um, listening to, to today's discussion, there's been quite a lot of um, back and forth on how China and recipient countries reconcile narratives about the type of Chinese investments and benefits. Um, but ultimately, I think um, if I could, you know, use the so-called civil society and civic actors cheat note, they are a couple of points where we are really concerned. First and foremost, transparency and access to information. Um, I think speakers, you know, um, in previous sessions, they've illuminated on um, um, the sense of agency and demands from host countries and recipient countries of Chinese investments. But the question is, have citizens actually been given access mm. to providing input and putting forward their own demands? Do citizens really want mega bridging projects you know, mine and road corridors that actually do not provide any benefits from them. Um, secondly, we are also witnessing on the issue of access to information transparency, how across several countries in Southeast Asia, in East West Africa, in Southeast Europe and Central Asia, where countries actually circumvent their own legislation in preventing citizens access to critical environmental, social and financial information that are um, very, very important for um, ensuring the fitness of those projects. Secondly, where's the public in the so-called agency discussion and demand discussion? Um, let's not forget the particular Chinese characteristics, um, which are basically denying the public's participation in such discussions. Um, unfortunately, as a result of that, we are also seeing how Recipient countries are increasingly developing and employing the so-called blended approach in securitizing and militarizing those projects in order to protect both Chinese companies and the host country's interest in ensuring the implementation of those projects. Most importantly, I think, um, we talk about citizens, um, which are the foundation of every nation, hopefully, um, still. Um, very few of their rights are actually recognized, and there is an increasing um, criminalization and clamping down on citizens and civil society organizations in countries where China actually um, is a leading or one of the largest FDI actors. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so those are the reflections um, that you know I can offer. Mm 
can can we just follow? I mean the countries where we have worked with civic actors and citizens negatively affected by Chinese landing investments. But the majority of them actually experience increasing reprisals for even seeking the most minimum grotesque information relating to the nature of the project, concerning environmental impacts, as well as social impacts ranging from resettlement, involuntary um, rehousing to life restoration. Um, again, um, we are actually seeing Despite you know um, the so-called trillion dollar amount that has been poured into China's overseas infrastructure investment and development projects, um, there is an increasing disengagement with the so-called people on the ground. Mm. And so I think this is a yeah, so this is a moment for China to against the backdrop of um, what the other speakers have illuminated, um, the so-called rethinking and pausing. Um, um, the Chinese investments inflow into their countries. This is an opportunity for China really to reconsider whether it's so called reconciling on the narratives as in development uh, development projects facilitated by China are actually helping the people. Um, and I think we need to have a more open and honest conversation about that in addition to the so-called economics and indebtedness. Ultimately, um, it is the citizens who bore the debt. Um, and overall, I think there is a total lack of agency if we look at many of those countries in the regions that I've mentioned above. Back uh, to you. Uh, Jude, would you like to to develop the points a bit? Sure, sure. I, I, I think this is an important point. Uh, someone like me, at my background, I was the Minister of Works, uh, Building Infrastructure, and before that, I ran the president's delivery unit, which again was about largely infrastructure. And sometimes there is a blind spot for um, the negative externalities of some of the investment we do and the partners that we go with. And so this is an important point for us to discuss. I think part of it is, uh, at least in my part of the world, something else that sort of, you know, the attractiveness of, of, of China as a partner was you know when the Chinese first come to Africa in the early 2000s for the first going out policy, um, they're regime agnostic. It, it can be a, a, a democratically elected government or a country run by a military junta. As long as there is something that calls itself a government there, the Chinese are willing to do business. <laughs> Secondly, um, they, there was no strings attached. It didn't mean that it didn't have an interest. It just meant that they didn't demand policy reforms as a, as a, in exchange for their engagement. And so in a, in a on a continent where there weren't that many democratic countries and there were a lot of uh, strong men, it, it was an excellent uh, a partner, so that's part of that. But I remember being here as a graduate student in the early 2000s and going to an event at the Cato Institute, I haven't been back for a while, um, and President Wad of Senegal was talking about how, as an African president, if you wanted to do anything for decades, the only options you had were Brussels and Washington. And because Brussels and Washington always colluded, you, whatever Brussels told you, it was echoed in Washington. The rise of Beijing as a third node of international power increased the leverage of countries in his position looking to do something different. So. Uh, there are always, regardless of what it is, any new thing that, in that in sort of um, uh, bestows advantages also come with greater uh, disadvantages. And so I think uh, while I point about the impact on institutions, I think it's something worth taking into account. But uh, someone in my position, that may be a blind spot. Uh, Veda, would you like to come in on this uh, with any perspectives? No, I just wanted to build on what both um, Samantha and uh, Gyure mentioned. The idea about the wariness that exists when it comes to China being the only option and also the importance of alternatives. And I hope we talk about this more in the panel, but I think that other countries like India and even the US uh, need to reimagine how we can provide alternatives. Clearly, we cannot um, compete with um, the factors that Samantha mentioned, right? The speed, the scale, um, the instruments that China has at its disposal. But that just has to force us to reimagine how we can um, pool resources and find alternative frames of reference when it comes to engaging the global south. 
And I, I think it's a good uh, point to raise, and, and I'd like to come back at it from a slightly different perspective, and that is to say, I'd like to return to the question about the, the sharp drop in the volume of Chinese lending that we're now witnessing. And this mm -hmm. has really been going on for about five years, uh, I believe. And please correct me if I'm wrong in that. But um, China is experiencing a sharp economic slowdown, which has contributed uh, along with the debt problems that emerged at the time of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, to, to its pulling back to a much higher level of hesitancy about, shall we say, blanket uh, mm -hmm. lending and investments across the developing world. I'm curious, um, Sam, wh how, how you at, at Aid Data are seeing this, how you and your colleagues are analyzing it, and do you see that this, in essence, opens doors for other alternatives mm -hmm. for lending from other lenders? And they I'll come back to you in a minute. We might we might bring India into this most directly? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Is the right question. Um, let me provide some state of play and then kind of break that down. So first, you know, people often tell me or ask me, oh, is this China getting out of the infrastructure game? And I would say, no, I don't think that is the case. But what is, what is happening is it's changing. I like to say that China is um, pivoting from bankrolling new infrastructure projects to bailing out the old infrastructure projects, meaning that it wants to make sure that these things don't fail before it starts um, bankrolling new new initiatives. So I think you're you're seeing still a formidable amount of lending that is actually more than what you see from the U.S., um, but it's more in the in the form of this emergency lending and trying to boost liquidity. So it's shifting. Um, in terms of the broader challenges that you outlined for China, um, I think it's absolutely true. You know, you see declining industrial productivity, you see impatience at home. I mean, China has been grappling with this for a long time. You know, citizens asking kind of pointed questions, which is interesting given the, the low levels of, of free, uh, freedom of expression. Why are we bankrolling development in other countries where we have substantial inequalities at home? Um, I will say that you know the idea that China is bankrupt is probably not really helpful. You think about, look at an indicator like foreign currency reserves. China has over $3 trillion in foreign currency reserves. That far outstrips any other country, including the US. Um, and so you know, this is what is the fuel to continue to finance things like Xi's signature development in initiative with, with the BRI. So, I think you know financially they they still have a, a formidable war chest. Um, secondly, I think because it's so highly tied to Xi himself, I think it's unlikely. It's almost too big to fail. They can't totally you know throw this in the, in the rubbish bin. But I do think the risk appetite is indeed changing because China has gotten burned way too way too many times. Um, and so you know the question of like where do we go from here is one of supply and demand. So the supply question is you know will China continue to be willing to supply? Um, I think that it will continue to supply but maybe at lower levels. It's going to be less willing to invest in the riskiest countries. I think it's going to be less willing to take on the riskiest projects. I think you see them already trying to diversify a little bit the types of projects they're investing in. Um, and this raises a quandary of how does that then align to what partner countries say that they want and expect from China. And I go back to that statistic I said earlier. Even as late as 2023, last year, people still view China as the infrastructure banker. If China is not willing to be the infrastructure banker, it puts it at odds with what these partner countries want. So that does create an opportunity uh, for some of these other players that we talked about. But there's also some questions about whether these other players will show up in a meaningful way. You know, I think historically, uh, the G7, including the US, have been long on rhetoric and, l and light on actual bankrolling and financing of these infrastructure initiatives. Um, and so there's a question about whether that will change. Um, so I would say two different ways that uh, alternative players, be it India or others in the, re in, in the region or in the, in the US, can think about this. So one is um, indirect competition, meaning how do you reduce the likelihood that lending can create negative externalities in countries. And that's investing and doubling down in you know, the types of things that Wawa was talking about. It's about um, building a strong civil society. It's about investigative journalism. It's about watchdog capacity, right? Um, it's about building the capacity of people in those aid management units and in line ministries to effectively assess what is worth taking on debt financing and mm -hmm. can we repay. 
On the direct side, I think if you know an India or a US or whomever wants to really go head to head on delivering infrastructure, we have to majorly increase the amount of money that we're willing to put on the table. I think the US with the Development Finance Corporation, it's kind of an interesting thing. You are starting to see um, an increase in our own debt financing overseas. If that continues and scales, not only here, but in other countries, maybe we'll have something to offer to compete. And there's been a lot of rhetoric out of the G7 about going in this direction, but fundamentally up. not a lot of money. Mm. Right. Exactly. Veda, um, coming back to alternative sources, um, do you think that, that the, the, sh the pulling back by China that, that we're witnessing or the slowing down of lending uh, pre presents real opportunities for other countries, uh, other lenders? Um, I know that India is, is active in, in many parts of, of the developing world uh, in this, but not on a scale of China, obviously. But I'm curious what perspective you might offer. Yeah, I think it's been very interesting in my conversations with, let's pick the infrastructure sector, right? My conversations with managers of Lassen and Tubro, Sharpunji Pulunji, um, several Indian infrastructure companies. Um, Everyone brought up China before I brought up China, which is to say that you know it was it's completely changed um, the way uh, business is usually done. Uh, but at the same time, the 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 feedback I kept getting was you know let's not get stuck on what the 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 competition that China brings to the table because the market is so huge. You know the African infrastructure gap. Everybody knows this is uh, it's. It's it's a huge gap, and there's actually a lot of opportunity for a lot of um, players to sort of step up. So they didn't. There was never a problem of them losing out on business or them never finding new frontiers for business because of Chinese um, competition. So there's definitely. Um, so again, Indian actors aren't new to the landscape. They've been active in Africa for many years, especially the private sector. So when we start to reimagine a renewed Indian interest in Africa, the private sector has traditionally taken the lead. I foresee that they will continue to take the lead. What could happen possibly is the government of India working in some form or fashion um, closely with um, the private sector, maybe trying to identify strategic projects to try and align um, their activities. But again, it's obviously not going to be at the scale that China has operated in, but um, I don't think that um, China withdrawing necessarily has um, is, is is the only factor that's in play here. But I also do want to mention that a lot of Indian tech companies, a lot of Indian telecom companies, um, social enterprises in India that have been very successful in finding very low cost, scalable solutions for big problems in India are now um, you know, sharing their knowledge and sharing the models with um, uh, governments of provinces in several African countries. So you also see um, various um, Beyond state to state and beyond the private sector, you see um, models of cooperation emerge um, from India, which I think has a lot of hope and which is also very, um, what is also very encouraging is a lot of these models, some of these models are financed by um, funders in the US and Europe. So there's also a lot of uh, potential for triangular cooperation um, mm -hmm. at a moment of time like this. I'm going to shift uh, direction a little bit before we, sh we go to the audience questions. and. Um, we're talking debt. Normally, when you talk about international sovereign debt, you end up talking about the Bretton Woods institutions, um, the restructuring of loans under their under their guys uh, guidance. Um, I'm going to stay out of this one, even though I spent more than 20 years at the IMF and let other people offer probably fresh perspectives. Um, what I'm interested in in is what you all think about the role of international organizations, multilateral institutions uh, in monitoring and addressing uh, the impact of China's lending, China's debt diplomacy on the recipient countries who are now turning to the IMF and others for support. Mm -hmm. uh, Jude, would you like to just to lead off? Sure. I, I think um, big countries, China and the United States and, and some of the Europeans, attempt to continue to drive their foreign policy through the way their executive directors vote, whether it's at the IMF or at the World Bank. Um, I think the issue of um, shares reallocation to reflect um, 
the, the expanding growth in India and China's economies um, create problems with these institutions. But I, I th and so for the IMF and, and, the, and, and the World Bank, they have to be really careful in, so that they don't step on the toes of one of the very big actors, including China. And in the case of the Zambian debt, even though the Chinese eventually walked back Walk this back. Well, I don't know how far they did, but initially, uh, China insisted that the multilaterals also take a haircut. Yes. Right. Uh, China insisted that it was the China China Commercial Bank uh, um, uh, that one of their policy banks be treated as a com as a um, uh, basically not as a state-owned enterprise, but as a right. commercial I bank. Th I think it was XM Bank. Okay. And and basically, what it meant was this. There is no law that says that multilateral institutions would be preferred creditors, but that is the tradition. And, and, and if China had continued to argue that point where multilateral creditors were treated like any commercial bank, it would have collapsed the entire development model. Because multilateral development banks, they're not, they have the triple A ratings because we know no one is going to default on their debt to the multilateral development banks. And with that, without that risk, they can have a triple A model. But the argument China was making would have completely collapsed that model. It's great that China walked that back. So yeah, there, there, there are challenges to monitoring because we need a disinterested, uh, to some, some extent, third party who can be an arbiter to say um, who has a fair outlook on what is happening in countries' finances. And so I think China's argument that it is not attempting to uh, change the international system that China is a uh, contributing member of the international system would have suffered. That argument would have suffered if China had continued at that point. But I think that remains uh, remains a challenge. But I just wanted to add because I just spent the semester in China, mm -hmm. and um, about four months ago, Wang Yi, the um, foreign minister, did this give, give this speech locally in which he said that if the West wanted to compete, by West he meant the United States, wanted to compete, we should see who can build the more, most roads in developing countries, who can do this. And people went crazy on Weibo. Like, who's supposed to pay for this? Like, you know, like, uh, uh, because the economy in China isn't going as great as, as and when you travel across the country, you see a lot of, I'm, I'm not talking abandoned uh, uh, cities without people, I mean stalled projects. And um, you go to shopping malls and stuff, you can see the visible evidence that people aren't spending. And so that change itself means that the way China behaves globally is also going to change. And it might provide an opportunity for, say, Global Gateway, which is the European thing, or um, PGII, which is the one, the G7 one that has been led by the United States. But my colleagues at the Center for Global Development, Europe, uh, reviewed PG um, Global Gateway, and, and their conclusion is that Global Gateway was simply a repackaging of old commitments. So we don't know, even though there's an opportunity here for a new actor to emerge, there, is, there doesn't seem to be a new actor on this mm -hmm. stage. Uh, while, while staying with the international organizations, of course, and you touched on this, um, the Bretton Woods institutions, often their conditionality relates to governance transparency and, and related issues. Um, do you think that given the nature of the debt crisis right now that, that there's a, a need for them to re-engage or engage in, with, with a higher profile in addressing these issues, uh, many of which have, as you suggest, have worsened under the Chinese? Um, that's an excellent question. I don't know if I can, I can answer the question in entirety but I'm gonna give it a try. First, I'd like to take a step back um, and really refocus on the governance question and how China has reshaped that. Um, since the council is based in DC, let's take the World Bank Safeguards Review pretty quickly. The World Bank, which is a US dominant bank, um, was attempting to actually integrate human rights due diligence and a number of other um, important governance aspects into so-called safeguards, only to have China say no because this will interfere with internal affairs. In the end, China won. And according to research by Dr. Corina Horta, who has been um, studying the Britain Woods institutions, um, basically, this led to China 
talking about the opportunity in establishing its own competitor to the Breaking Woods Institution, the Beijing-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank in 2015. Um, what ensued was that um, with very little support from countries like the United States and Japan, um, China won a major diplomatic victory um, where the G7 actually split on AIB membership. Um, and that um, through the so-called um, Western donors, um, the AIB was able to gain um, major credit rating um, with the AAA. Um, please note that China, India, Russia, the AIB's larger shareholders do not actually have such a rating, nor does the new development bank. Um, what ensued was that in 2018, according to Dr. Hor uh, Karina Horta's research, AIB issued first bonds to raise capitals on international capital markets to increase its existing um, register capitals to $100 billion. And so, Jeremy, back to your question, it appears to be that China is clearly crafting out an alternative order to um, what we have been discussing. And obviously, this definitely has an impact on um, the governance aspect that I think um, civil society organizations focus very much on because it's the only way through which to hold any institution accountable and for, for it to be uh, um, to allow citizens participation. Um, unfortunately, with the AIB um, rewriting of the rules, we are actually seeing a weakening of standards across the board mm. of US-led or participated Britain with institutions where it concerns transparency, accountability, as well as human rights. Um, to the extent that the Britain with institutions are now almost adopting the China approach mm. in separating human rights from development. Um, I know I'm probably deviating from your question, but this is what I can offer. No, thank you, that's Thanks. very helpful. Um, we, we've got time for a couple of the audience questions at this point. We've got a little over five minutes left. Um, let's stay with transparency, but from a different point of view. The, the question comes in, do we see a difference in terms of transparency or lending terms between countries with stronger demo democratic institutions and civil society versus ones with, where, where those institutions are weaker? Uh, and even if there is little choice in borrowing, how much agency do local governments have to set more accountable terms. Sam, is this something that, that, that you in your work, you, your team has taken a look at? Yeah, I mean, I think we could speak to that anecdotally, country by country. Um, I think that, you know, China is still highly restrictive in what it publicizes on the supplier side. Mm -hmm. um, I think what can change, uh, depending upon the level of democracy and openness at the country level, is what recipient partners to China are willing to publish. So, you know, for every deal, <laughs> there's, there's, there's folks on the China side, there's folks on the recipient country side, depending upon the legal environment, you know, there's a higher burden of disclosure uh, in some of these democracies. I think that um, how much agency do people have um, I think it still comes down to uh, the the degree of supply. You know, how many different um, different options do countries have to finance some of these projects? If there are more options, that increases the negotiation leverage for greater transparency. Mm. Um, where there are fewer options, you tend to see very very high unwillingness to push back. Another question has to do with this a related issue which has to do with the import of Chinese workers to, Im to work on infrastructure projects in various countries. Um, in the, the level of this uh, uh, varies and has changed over time. But Nicole Gold Golden, who's a colleague here at the Atlantic Council, says it remains a significant factor, an issue in many recipient countries. Um, how could this be addressed through the financing side of things? Have, have, uh, Jude, you were involved in public works. Perhaps you've had to address this issue uh, on the ground. Yeah. Um, and in my travel on the continent, the only place I saw this was in Equatorial Guinea. But then there were um, circumstances that may have prompted that. The Equatorial Guinea chose at the last moment to host the AU summit, and, and they needed to build those buildings quickly, and they brought in a lot of Chinese workers. I, I think 
Um, because of the demographic issues in China, it is probably more expensive to have a Chinese worker come to do work in Africa now than it was. So maybe that was the case, I don't know, up to 2008. But um, I, I don't think that's, in my part of the world, in a place that I'm familiar with, I don't think that's an issue anymore. I think you still have uh, foremen and supervisors who might be Chinese, but I would say anywhere between 85 and 90 percent of workers on uh, construction pro uh, projects would tend to be locals. So this is less of an issue than it yeah, has been, been presented been at times. Yeah. Sam? Can I just jump in real quickly? I would agree with that. I think you're starting to see the shift um, in two ways. So one, I have seen certain countries start to push back by putting in these agreements uh, requirements for a junior partner that's within, within the host country, um, or like requirements on the maximum of Chinese imported laborers you can use. I also think China is trying, is recognizing that they are facing headwinds. And so you th see things like these Luvan workshops, which are um, partnerships between higher education uh, actors in China and host institutions, and they're training local labor forces to work on Chinese projects. So mm. those are two examples. Before we finish, is there anything that anybody would like to add uh, before we close? May I interject quickly, um, quickly on the labor issue here? Um, back in 2021, um, in Europe, we were able to report on the forced labor of so-called smuggled and trafficked Vietnamese workers contracted through Chinese state-owned enterprises, which implies the Chinese state actually authorizes jointly together with the host country. And so, um, anecdotally, we have actually been observing an increase of the so-called non-transparent exchange and use of um, bonded laborers across different sectors, which we cannot really go into now, given the time limitations. So, um, and this also includes quite a few cases in East Africa, where um, China is leading major infrastructure investment projects. So I do think this is an underreported and underregulated issue in some countries still. Mm. OK. Well, I think that we've sort of hit our limit. We've gone, we started sort of looking at, at, at things in the microcosm, went to some big picture issues, and we brought it back down to earth at the end. It's probably a good place to stop, obviously. It would be great to continue this conversation, but there's a lot more room to cover in the next day and a half. Um, I'm asked to uh, tell everyone that there's going to be a 15-minute break for a leisurely lunch right now. And, uh, and then I guess we'll all, we'll all reconvene around 1 o'clock or so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.